for attending this uh, kind of impromptu uh, RSD curve. Um, my name is Stephen Borstelman. I am an interventional radiologist in uh, Boca Raton, Florida, and I have become a machine learning and deep learning aficionado um, for a number of years now. Uh, and uh, I actually am doing research and trying to publish in the area uh, and trying to anticipate some of the problems that we as radiologists uh, face uh, in terms of uh, machine learning. So I'm going to tell you right now that uh, my focus as a radiologist is, of course, you know, patient data and healthcare, and particularly, um, com you know, computer vision applications, but not exclusively. There are NLP applications. Um, the things that I'm going to be talking about today are very broad and generalized. And while some of the data and examples are taken from the radiology literature, um, it should be applicable to you. Um, so what we're going to do today is we're going to start off and uh, we're going to review the ROC curve in detail. Uh, and I'm going to discuss some alternative metrics. Uh, once I give my presentation, you will understand why that we need to look at these alternative metrics. Um, and then finally, I think that we should just quickly uh, go through the ROC curve in Geron, that section, uh, run the code and discuss it. Uh, so we'll have a, a small hands-on practicum at the end. Um, I would like to request that you perhaps hold questions for the end, unless something is really, you know, glaring. Um, the, a lot of, I think a, the presentation is organized in such a way that it answers a lot of your questions. Um, the, other thing is that I am a New Yorker. Once again, I tend to talk quickly and swallow my syllables. If I am difficult for you to understand, please stop me, make me enunciate that. Yeah, speak up. All right. So without further ado, let's start the presentation. So this is a, a presentation that I originally uh, gave at the 2019 uh, annual meeting of the Radiology Society of North America uh, to a few hundred people. Uh, it was an invited lecture um, and it's called Beyond ROC. And the purpose of it is to judge the real life performance of algorithms. Um, I will uh, let you know that uh, I have no uh, relevant financial disclosures beyond owning stock in Google. I don't have any financial interest in the uh, AI's companies that I am uh, discussing here today. So one of the reasons why I kind of got into this area is that the algorithmic evaluation of deep learning is, is a lot like the Wild West in the sense that there isn't really any uh, rhyme or wherefore uh, to it and we need to start figuring out what works and what doesn't, especially as we're, you know, proceeding toward uh, regulatory approval. Um, the, the paradigm that's working currently is, you know, heavily based off of uh, what, uh, you know, pharmaceutical companies and uh, medical device companies uh, have done in the past. Uh, and that may or that probably is a good place to start, but it may not be the end all. Uh, of where we need to go. So I'll, I'll just let you know that radiology and medicine have actually been using AI in different forms for quite a while. You just might not know it. Um, in the 1960s and 1970s, the first steps were taken. Uh, they were all hard-coded, uh, you know, projects in low resolution. Uh, in the 1980s, we started to go to the expert systems uh, Mycin, Caduceus, and they are run through an old uh, code called LISP. In 1982, we achieved our first uh, PAC system, which is how we could display images not on a film, but on a monitor. And then for interoperability and uh, storage of those, we'd created the DICOM standard. 
so different machines could talk to different monitors and different systems. There was a huge integration back in the 1990s to 2000s where we went completely from reading off of film to exclusively reading off of um, uh, computers and our um, productivity exploded. Um, in 1998, uh, image, uh, the R2 image checker was the first FDA approved CAD uh, for uh, mammography. Uh, and this was actually a program that, you know, would run, look at the uh, mammogram and select areas that it felt that you should take a second look at uh, that were more likely to be cancer uh, than not. Uh, and now in 20, well, recently in 2017, uh, Arteris uh, Cardio DL was the first FDA approved uh, deep learning algorithm. So, in terms of radiology and where we were, back in 2014, this wasn't on anybody's radar. It wasn't even on my radar. Um, in 2015, we kind of found out about it, but nobody really knew what it was. In 2016, every knew it was something. They knew sort of kind of you use Python and TensorFlow, Keras or PyTorch, but how do you do anything with it? How do you put data into it? How do we, you know, what data do we have? How does it work? In 2017, there was a, a significant paper that came, two things that happened. First, the NIH released the chest X-ray 14 data set by Wang. Um, and shortly thereafter, Andrew Ng and his team at Google and Stanford released the ChexNet algorithm uh, and proudly proclaimed that they had results that were better at detecting pneumonia than people. Um, that subsequently didn't hold water, but it was very uh, interesting and everybody was uh, very excited and very worried for about a month until we were able to pin down what was actually happening. 2018, everybody was developing uh, fantastic results with proprietary algorithms and proprietary data sets that nobody was willing to talk about because the VCs would kill them. Uh, and now in, tw in 2019, when I uh, wrote this uh, uh, the first time, we had 150 different uh, potential AI vendors uh, uh, showing at the uh, convention hall. Um, so the big question is always how to separate the hope, uh, which is that we do something great for our patients uh, from the hype, uh, which is, you know, we're just doing this to sell to the next VC at, you know, a, a great, valuation and get rich. So we need to start with basic statistics. All right. And the statistics is something that is, you know, mandated for us in the field of mammography. Uh, we need to report the sensitivity, specificity, and positive predictive value of each reader. Um, sensitivity is defined as true. Uh, well, first take a look at the right side of the screen. That is your confusion matrix. And I want to point out to you that if you recall my comment in the class uh, last week, um, the confusion matrix as its output in scikit-learn is kind of flipped. Your true negatives um, are going to be in that first box and the true positives are in the bottom box. So you always have to kind of know, you know, in the sense that, you know, there are different conventions, but it's, it's the same thing. So if we take sensitivity, the sensitivity is calculated by the true positives over the true positives plus the false negatives. So what that means is how many cases are we picking up? What percentage of you know, the cases are we picking up? Specificity is true negatives over true negatives plus false positives. That means how many, you know, how accurate is, not, not how accurate, how, good is our test and reliable. If it really, you know, if it really gives us, it says, no, you don't have the disease. How sure can we be of that? Positive predictive value is the expectation of positivity of a test. The true positives over all the positives. You know, what percentage of the time do I expect to get a positive value? I'll just leave this up for a second and next. 
So there are lots of statistics and, and you can take the confusion matrix, and this is you know, from the Wikipedia page on confusion matrix, which is actually pretty reasonable. Um, and you know, as long as someone doesn't salt it, you know, I think it's pretty accurate. Um, you can, you know, there are lots of different metrics and measures that you can get from this, okay? True positive rate, false positive rate, false negative, you know, sensitivity, specificity, prevalence, positive predictive value, negative predictive value, accurate. All these things, you know, are, are derivatives of the actual confusion matrix and are useful in different circumstances. And there are even more if you start, you know, normalizing and you start, you know, doing some funky stuff. We're going to talk about a few of these uh, and we're going to delve into them. Before I do that, and I brought this up the other day, um, I want to bring up the issue of class imbalance. And this is something that I'm interested in from a research aspect. And, you know, okay, Borstelman, who's Borstelman? I don't know Borstelman, okay? Well, don't take my word for it. You know, this is Ian Goodfellow, okay? Asking around for papers uh, on class imbalance. Uh, and uh, Massey Mazeroski, who has actually written a really good paper on class, two really good papers on class imbalance, um, uh, you know, responded. And I've, I've cited Massey uh, a few times. I think he has a, two really good papers and I recommend them uh, for those who are interested. Um, so class imbalance is when you look at the number of labels of something compared to something else. So take a, a, a simple database of cats and dogs, all right? If you have a thousand cats and a thousand dogs, you are balanced, your classes are balanced. If you instead have 10,000 cats and 10,000 dogs, your classes are imbalanced. Sorry, 10,000 cats and 1,000 dogs, your classes are imbalanced. And that imbalance may affect your algorithm in ways you don't think of. Um, I'm not paying attention to the chat. I'm not sure if someone is trying to get a hold of something I'm saying here. Um, is anybody trying to, is there something I'm, I'm okay. I'm just going to keep going on. You guys interject if there's something I'm missing here. So I wanted to give you some examples of what data is balanced and what data is imbalanced. Okay. And we have three examples here. I'd like you to pay attention. The first case is a relatively balanced data set. Um, we have, 36 true positives, 40 true negatives, and a few false negatives and false positives. Um, the middle data set is an imbalanced data set. Uh, we have 91, 33 true negatives, and only seven false negatives. And the final one is a severely imbalanced data set. This is something that you might see in anomaly detection or fraud data sets, where you have one true positive and 100,000 true negatives. If you don't want to write the confusion matrix out in a paper, you can, you know, put this class ratio that kind of discloses uh, what things are. You know, for, you, you can make the argument that a four to one ratio is, well, that's slightly imbalanced. Yeah, it's slightly imbalanced, but it, it probably doesn't make any effect on your, uh, your outcomes for that. Now, a 1300 to one ratio is going to, potentially has some effects and I, and a uh, 100,000 to one uh, ratio certainly will. There's a, uh, so keep these three algorithms and data sets in mind. Uh, we'll come back to it later. So if we're gonna talk about the ROC curve, you guys should know how to make it. And I'm gonna, use some, I'm just going to go through this. I don't think you have to actually do this, 
but I know someone's going to ask about it. So I'm going to just put it out there and this is how you actually do it. If you have a training data set, let's call it data set X. Okay. And X has N number of, you know, data instances. In my case, it would be a chest X-ray. In your case, it could be something else. And P number of probabilities associated with that. Okay. I'm going to assume a binary classification where the P is either a zero or a one. It's either negative or it's positive. And of course, everything always adds up. So the total number of cases is going to be the positive cases and the negative cases. And the total number of probabilities is going to be the positive probabilities and the negative probabilities. So each, if we take a single, you know, focus or single data point out of the data set, okay, X, and that's going to be X sub I, let's, you know, it could be like six or 12 or whatever, okay, it is going to have its own P sub I, which is going to be positive or negative, all right? I'm going to run that, I'm, I've, I've, I'm going to run my data set through my training algorithm. It's whatever algorithm that we chose to use. It might be a, a random force, it might be a support vector machine, it might be a deep learning algorithm. But it's ultimately going to pop out a probability, P hat I, okay, for that data point X sub I, which is that item with the label N sub I and, and capital P sub I. Okay, hope you're all following that. Then what we're gonna do is we are going to rank order the pairs by their probabilities, comparing P hat sub I with P, capital P sub I. P hat is the output probability from the classifier. P is the ground truth probability, what we gave it in the first place. We're gonna rank those high to low. We're gonna then run, have a running tally of the cumulative instances of positive and negative. When we run that tally and we add them all up, okay, it's gonna match those numbers that we set up above. So since we know the ground truth, since we know the actual truth of our data and we have the output probabilities, we can actually make a confusion matrix, all right? And then we can calculate the sensitivity and specificity for each value. And that is this table over here on the right. And for each, they have 5,200 cases, 2,600 positive and 2,600 negative. So this is a balanced data set. For each thing that they put in, okay, they are going to get out, spit out a output probability. So if you see, I'm going to try to do the annotation. If you see here, let me try that. If you see here, the classifier output is almost perfect for a, this is the P hat, this is the P. This is what we get, this is what we know. And for these different data points, the confidence of the predictor or classifier decreases. Now, in this case, we have a P equals zero, but it's outputting a high probability, all right? So this would be an example of a false uh, positive. This is something that is ranked as positive. It's not positive, it's negative. This is a false positive, all right? This is a true positive. Here, at, on the bottom, we're going to the end, 0 0.0034, this is viewed as a negative, and it is a positive. So this is a false negative, okay? And then these are true negatives. I hope that's clear to everybody. Finally, we calculate the sensitivities and the specificities from the formulas I gave you earlier. 
Now, because it's an ROC curve, we're gonna use one minus specificity. All right, before I, before I go on, I am gonna ask if I have shared this clearly and everybody is okay and I can move on. Um, it would have, Stephen, it would have helped if uh, on that blank part of the screen, if you had the uh, calculate, the equation for sensitivity and specificity also shown just for the dumb ones who can't remember what you had on the previous screen. Hold on a second. Was this what you were, was this what you were asking for? Exactly, the one on the left-hand side. Yeah. If, uh, sensitivity and specificity, those uh, formulas could just be copied over onto the blank part of the next screen. Hmm. Not that we have to make edits in real time. Okay, there you go. Now, okay, I'm gonna continue. So when you plot those on a graph, like with matplotlib, this is what you're going to get. You're gonna get a curve that it's a little unfamiliar because it's oriented uh, towards the left instead of being a curve that's oriented toward the right. And there are a few, we're plotting sensitivity versus one minus specificity. And there are a few um, lines here that I'll go through. The first line is the random case. And this is this purple dot, dotted line that you can see where Hang on. This purple dot, uh, sorry, this purple solid line here, which is no predictive value, okay? This is the random case in a binary classifier, all right? So if your ROC curve is like that, you have nothing. Now, I have two models. I have a model A in yellow, and I model B in orange. Model A lies closer to the upper left-hand corner than Model B. We would expect we would expect Model A to be a better classifier or better test, a, a better ROC curve rather than Model B, um, and an optimal, a perfect. Uh, ROC curve would be something along these lines. And you will see that on the next slide. I'm going to mention that you can also take the integral of the area under the curve, which is also called the AUC ROC. And that number is interesting uh, and kind of useful. Um, but there are some things you have to watch out for with it. A lot of times uh, that number will be used to compare algorithms. Uh, and that's fine in some circumstances. You just have to know what you're getting. Um, it's a, a useful single number summary. Generally better is uh, larger is better. Um, let's see if I can, I don't. So how do we interpret the ROC curve? This is just 
letting you know what's going on. Uh, we have on the left a perfect ROC curve where negatives and positives are completely separated and they have no overlap. So we have, you know, basically 100% discrimination between the two and everything is fantastic. Now that's not a real life scenario. So, you know, a lot of times that there will be some overlap between negatives and positives. And this is now this ROC curve. Hold on. Here, where you have a, a decent ROC curve, it doesn't exactly hit the corner, but it's pretty good. And, oops, sorry. And you see that there are two separate there's a, there's a bimodal distribution, but there is overlap in this area. And this is a, an AUC of about 75%. Um, this is the random case where they completely overlap and you can't separate the two. You cannot discriminate against the two. And this is garbage. Um, by the way, if the AUC is under 50%, that's an indication that you have a, a negative, but it generally doesn't work out that way. Um, it's just, you know, the converse is true instead of the, the statement that you made. So with the ROC curve, it is a spectrum of possibilities that you can operate at um, it's not a single possibility. Uh, and you're going to have to choose an operating point on that ROC curve. And the easiest choice to use is the, the point at which false positives equal false negatives, and it's called the equal error rate. Um, if you want to get more sophisticated, you have to ask what you're trying to do uh, and you know what you're trying to optimize. So this is an example of an ROC curve where we have the equal error rate. Um, and the equal error rate is a lot of times just found by drawing the opposite diagonal down uh, as opposed to the random line. Um, I will point out here that in this area, these are operating thresholds of the ROC curve where sensitivity dominates. If you were developing, hold on, let me show you on that, this area. If you were developing a algorithm for screening, okay, like we do in mammography, you want to pick up as many cases as possible with less regard to the accuracy of those cases that you're picking up. We'll, we'll sort that out later. Okay, but you want to find the cases. So, you know, you're essentially imagining or hallucinating things. And that is very appropriate for a, you know, a screening test like mammography. Um, conversely, if you have a test in which it's absolutely critical to have an exact answer, okay, that is this zone down here. Uh, which is kind of vertical and that could cause its own issues, but I'm not going to get into that today. Um, the important point is that the, this is a starting point and optimization will occur, you know, on a practical basis, you know, where you are going to operate the algorithm. So when we look at the ROC curve, What's good about it is that it's an intuitive plot of the rate of true positives versus the rate of false positives. It's generally somewhat understood, but it's, it's widespread accepted. People use this all the time. It is a visualization for comparing algorithms. The AUC ROC allows for a single number statistic for comparison. And here's one important point. It's prevalence invariant. 
I'm going to show you more on this later, okay, but be aware of this. Um, disadvantages of, and when I mean say prevalence invariant, what I really mean is it's class imbalance invariant. Um, we will come back to that. One of the disadvantages uh, are that high performing algorithms kind of tend to overlie each other, li li limiting the visual differentiability. This is a practical uh, aspect in my field. Um, some areas of the ROC curve indicate trivial operating points, especially those toward the upper right or lower left hand corner. Uh, you would never operate at 99% sensitivity, 1% specificity, it's just not done. Um, it can be inaccurate in class imbalance. And then finally, um, the AUC is, ROC is not a good measure of the performance of a system in a specific application, but it aims to give an indication of its applicability across a range of operating conditions. That's a quote from one of the guys who's really smart on this stuff. So let me give you a practical aspect. This is um, a study of three different radiology AI systems that are in production and, and were used uh, to detect tuberculosis uh, in uh, Cameroon and Nepal. And what happened was that they said, okay, we're gonna run these three systems and we're gonna compare them to each other. And they did, and this is what they got. Um, take a look. Uh, two of these are deep learning, the Luna and Cure, and the Delft was a machine learning. I think maybe a, either a, a random force or support vector machine, but I believe that they've come out with a new uh, version that is deep learning. So three systems, they all stack up like crazy here, okay? And in this area, which is kind of the operating area, like if you think about the, the equal error rate, okay? but we want to be a little bit more sensitive uh, in terms of where we're going to pick up things. Okay. They're just all over each other. And I couldn't choose any algorithm that was superior by that. There is a suggestion. Um, the QXR and the LUNIT both have AUC ROCs of 0.94, um, which are slightly, is slightly higher than the CAD for TB at 0.92 but these are all within acceptable confidence intervals of each other. And it's really hard to pick between uh, the three. So the problem with ROC and AUC ROC is that as I've shown you, the ROC ranks randomly picked pairs and sees how the test correctly rank orders them. And the question is, what does that even mean? I, I'm not even sure that that like translates into English. Um, and what ROC is actually measuring is the probability that a randomly chosen subject from one outcome group will have a higher score than a randomly chosen subject from the other, uh, other outcome group. Well, okay, that's a little bit better of a definition, but what does that mean? I'm not really sure. AUC ROC does not mean the proportion classified correctly. It is something like accuracy, but it is not accuracy. It is a purely discriminant comparator, and it says nothing about calibration. You have to use the exact same data between two algorithms to compare them. You change the data, this is not usable, okay? So what are we gonna do? We talked about precision recall curves last time. I will just refresh your memory that as opposed to the ROC curve, better here is the upper right. So model A would be a, a better precision recall curve than model B. Um, it turns out that the AUC of the precision recall curve can be obtained also. And it's basically something called average precision. Uh, with a difference of how the value at zero is calculated uh, because it can be am ambiguous. Um, that's a little bit finer a distinction than I care to go into. Comparing 
So now talking about precision recall curves, well, their advantages are that they're useful for a range of performances. They're useful for imbalanced classes. That's an alternative means of visual separation to ROC. Now, some authors have said that PRC and AUC PR or average precision is more informative, informative than ROC and AUC ROC for binary classifiers on imbalanced data sets, but that's controversial, okay? I think as a sanity check, it's a great idea because R optimizing ROC does not necessarily optimize PRC. Disadvantages is that these curves are not necessarily smooth. This may cause difficulty, you know, interpolating between points or calculating the average precision. Um, the horizontal baseline, let me go back to this. It turns out that this baseline is not necessarily fixed. In a binary classification with two classes, this is here at 0.5. This is the random model. If you add more classes, this starts dropping. And I'll show you the, an example of that uh, a little later. And finally, there's an issue with bias in precision recall curves. So let's compare ROC and precision recall. And this is uh, from a paper, uh, Seidel and Remsmeister, and they were advocating for precision recall versus ROC. So on the left, we have two graphs that are ROC curves. We have this, which is a ROC with a balanced data set, the thousand positives and 1,000 negatives, and 1,000, and then an imbalanced data set, 1,000 positives and 10,000 negatives. We have five cases. We have perfect, excellent, good, not so good, and random, okay? What's the difference between the two plots in the imbalanced case? 10,000 to 1,000, 1,000, 1,000, zero, nothing, okay? It's completely the same. The precision recall curve is substantially different. We see the the this drop down uh, in the imbalanced case. This is imbalanced, this is balanced. The random case drops down here because of the imbalance. And we see there's better splitting of the different curves. There, it's more apparent which curve is kind of better than the other. Uh, so there is a, an effect on precision recall with class imbalance. So when we combine the four, okay, the spaces do map to each other mathematically. And it is mathematically provable that a curve that dominates, lies outside of, and does not cross in ROC space will dominate in PRC space and vice versa, all right? So mathematically, it's suggested that a classification algorithm with a better ROC, ROC, AUC, PRC, and PRC ROC, or, or average precision, is better than one without. So with that said, what are we going to do? We're going to try to go beyond now to some other statistics. So the first statistics that we use a lot in machine learning is accuracy. It's a, a really common deep learning metric. I can yank out about five books on deep learning uh, and uh, machine learning and tell you that this is one of the most applied statistics in things that you know, we'll run through. And we will, I, I'm pretty sure we'll see that in the uh, Garan book as well when we get to that chapter. But in Rashka, Lubanovic, um, Kuhn, I mean, they're, it's, it's all about accuracy, okay? Accuracy measures the true positives and true negatives divided by everything, okay? The problem with accuracy is that if you are looking for something that's rare, okay, you can get burned. And like, for example, in mammography, we have maybe five positive cases out of a thousand mammograms, right? So I could get 99.5% .9, 99 accuracy 
by indiscriminately just calling every case negative. The only cases I'll miss are the, are the five true positives. But the accuracy is fantastic, but doesn't work. So the F1 score also has been around. It's also called the dice source and the coefficient. And it's a harmonic mean of precision and recall. Um, it's actually a, a used in segmentation a lot. Um, it does address class imbalance, but it doesn't account for true negatives. True negatives are not there. And that's one of the reasons why it's good at segmentation because in segmentation, you have an infinite number of true negatives, um, coincidentally. There are two measures that are less frequently used. And I don't want to go into this too much right now, but they're called informativeness and markedness. And informativeness is sensitivity plus specificity minus one. And markedness is positive predictive value plus negative predictive value minus one. And informativeness is kind of the important one. Uh, it represents how much about your system is an edge. Uh, if you're a trader or a gambler, you know, how likely are you to do better than the dealer or the rest of the market? Um, how trustworthy are the, you know, rather, um, you know, what's your edge? Markedness is how trustworthy are your predictions um, as opposed to other output measures that go zero to one. This is a negative one to one. Uh, zero is the worst. Plus one and minus one are perfect correlates. Um, and interestingly enough, it turns out mathematically that AUC ROC in a single label, single threshold case equals informedness. There's something else called the Breer score. I put this in because Frank Harrell and I were having a discussion on Twitter regarding proper scoring metrics. And he feels that, you know, if it's not, if it, you know, if it's, if it's binary, it's not a proper scoring metric. Um, the best Breer score is a zero. Um, and it's kind of interesting because it resembles Pearson's R squared. Well, Pearson's R squared is related to Pearson's R, which brings us to the Matthews correlation coefficient. And, and part of the reason I've put together this lecture is that I'm a, a huge fan of the MCC. Um, the MCC is a, is a correlation coefficient uh, that is Pearson's R for the binary case. Uh, it goes from negative one to zero to one. It addresses class imbalance. It uses all four measures and its components are informedness and markedness. And it is the geometric mean of the two. You can use it in multi-class classifications as the RK measure. And if you take true negatives and you throw them to infinity, it's gonna become the G-score or the folks mallow score. And the G-score is the geometric mean of precision and recall. Um, it's interesting that precision and recall relationships maintain through their arithmetic, geometric, and harmonic means. I'm gonna skip Cohen's kappa here because this is more interesting for radiologists. We use it for measurements of intra-observer variability and intra-observer variability. And that's not relevant to you guys. Stephen, quick question. Uh -huh. um, can you go back two slides and just share what is inform informedness and markedness? I actually did go through that already. Informedness, okay. mm -hmm. sensitivity plus specificity minus one. It is your, your edge in prediction. And markedness is PPV plus NPV minus one. How trustworthy your prediction is. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Sure. So if we take these single measure statistics and go back to our examples that we talked about earlier, all right, let's look at our balance case. We run our algorithms. We get a sensitivity of 0.8, a specificity of 0.73, and a positive predictive value of 0.71. Our accuracy... is 0.76, which is reasonable. Our F1 score is pretty close at 0.75. 
the Matthews correlation is 0.5, which is decent, and the G score is 0.75. Again, very close, you know, between the F1 score and the G score. We go to our imbalance case, okay? And now we have a sensitivity of 0.98, specificity of 0.96, and positive predictive value of 0.5 my accuracy is 0.96. I'm getting excited now. I'm doing something awesome. My F1 score is 0.68. Oh, okay. My MCC is 0.7. That's good. That's a good MCC. And my G score is 0.72. Now, take a look at this last one. My severe imbalance. My accuracy is a whopping 0.998. I am calling my venture capitalist about my X-ray classifier, I am going to be rich, okay? Except for the fact that my Matthews correlation is 0.02, which means it's garbage. Um, so, you know, you can use these scores to kind of judge your model's predictivity uh, on different, uh, in different ways. I'm just gonna bring this up very quickly. You know, we're, we talk a lot about bias uh, in AI and, and it kind of means something to some people that's different than other people. Uh, and, you know, Jan LeCun left Twitter recently because of it, but I'm gonna just remind you that bias is actually a numerical term. And the, the thing about these measures is that when you look at them, here's precision recall, okay? And we see that in the space that measures precision recall, there's a lot of uh, variance as shown by this heat map. And we see that precision recall has a negative 0.87 to positive 0.87, um, variance essentially uh, for bias, um, the same as negative predictive value. If we compare, accuracy has some bias, negative 0 0.49, 0 0.49. Um, the F1 score has bias, but it's skewed. Uh, it's, not e it's not equal on, on both sides. It's actually skewed one way versus the other. If we look at um, the Matthews correlation, it has the least amount of bias um, out of the different measures uh, that include all four zones of the confusion matrix. And bookmakers, uh, this is a, this is informedness, um, this is sensitivity, and this is specificity. Uh, this is markedness. Um, so, I think that there's really something to be said for the MCC and, and also informedness in cases where intrinsic bias uh, in the algorithm uh, is a concern. So we talked about this briefly the other day about undersampling, oversampling. There's lots of questions on this in, in my field and I don't know answers. Um, I don't wanna, let's see how we're doing for time. Um, you know, when we have cases for a lot of rare diseases, we don't have a lot of cases. They just don't exist. Uh, we have lots of negatives. So what do you do with that? Do you, you know, train a wildly imbalanced data set, understanding that you're going to take a performance hit and you know it? Do you try to undersample your normals uh, compared to the rare uh, positives for this data set in your training? Do you conversely oversample your normals, uh, or sorry, oversample your diseases uh, to improve things? Do you do a, a technique like SMOTE? Do you start using synthetic data and GANs to create data that where it doesn't exist? Um, you know, it, we'll probably take a hit always simply because there's not a one-to-one -one incidence. Um, these are all questions that we have, you know, we don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I, if anybody here knows what to do, I'd love you to ed educate me. Um, you know, we talk about a lot about continuous learning in AI. You know, what's that gonna do? Is that gonna make things better or make things worse? Or, 
you know, is our algorithm even going to work at all? Because did we just get a lucky initialization the first time? Um, I will mention that Suchi Saraya's lab is working on something called resampling uncertainty estimation to try to evaluate the amount of bias that's inherent in an actual model itself. It's kind of interesting. It's super computationally expensive. From what I understand, I don't understand it. Um, I will recommend the PyCom package uh, on GitHub. Do you see this uh, to the right? PyCom takes your confusion matrix and spits out all this information. You don't even have to think about it. It's great. And they keep adding stuff to it all the time. Here's a Matthews. Here's an F1. Bookmakers, informedness, AUC, accuracy, whatever you want. It's a great package. Uh, we should be using it. Uh, and I'm not going to talk about R because we're Python people in this class. So what I'm recommending people to do when they are evaluating AI algorithms, I think there's a role for sensitivity and specificity, ROC and AUC, ROC. We know it, we use it, everybody knows it. Um, no need to reinvent the wheel. Um, I think for imbalanced data, we should consider adding precision and recall and uh, average precision uh, to get an idea of what's happening from the imbalance. I think it'll be very helpful. I think that the MCC is really underutilized and we should be using it a lot more and we should be publishing it a lot more. Um, so I'm gonna pass on that. If you're comparing individual doctors, don't compare individuals to groups. And that is it for this particular presentation. So I'm going to pause now and I'm going to ask you guys for specific questions on this part of the presentation. Anybody? Yeah, one request for your comment on what you didn't cover in the presentation, but uh, I have done a little bit in the paper is regarding the cost curve. Uh huh. Yeah, you know, when I did when I when I did the paper, you know, I was looking for something that was going to be better than the ROC curve, and I. I'm just not convinced that the Drummond Holte cross curve really adds much versus ROC um, in the sense that, you know, it, it's basically so much like ROC. It's, it maps to ROC space. It, you know, it's prevalence invariant, which means it's going to be, you know, uh, class imbalance invariant. So I already have that with ROC. What do I get out of using the, the cost curve? So I think that, you know, after probably in the 10 months that have transpired before, since I put that on the net and now, I think that, you know, the combination of ROC uh, and uh, PRC is far superior to, you know, ROC plus cost curve or cost curve you know, uh, on its own versus PRC. I, I would stick with the ROC. Um, and I'm not including that in the, in the paper I sent in. I, that was not included. That's why. Thanks. <laughs> um, quick uh, follow up. The ROC average is also threshold invariant, right? Or at least that's what is commented, but that seems it's just a different way of saying that it is across all thresholds. Is that a correct understanding? Yes. The ROC, the ROC curve shows all thresholds. Okay. In a, a real world environment, you would have to pick one to operate at. So does that mean you use your, uh, you can use ROC to get your optimal threshold for your particular 
situation and then you use that threshold for accuracy and other measures to get your yeah you, you, can, you can definitely i mean a lot of people do optimize roc optimization of roc there's quite a bit of stuff out there on that now my my question in my right, mind, but like if you then did an if, if you then did an if you then did an accuracy measure, like say I chose my threshold at 0.7, right. accuracy typically assumes a 0.5, so then I'd want to change that for my accuracy measure. I don't think accuracy necessarily assumes a 0.5. I think that accuracy is, you know, it's more of a, of, it only assumes a 0.5 when your data set is balanced. If your data set is imbalanced, then you can't assume that 0.5. So what you do is you pick your threshold and then you do your classification based on that threshold and then you calculate your accuracy. So your threshold might not be 0.5, it might be 0.7 or it might be 0.3 or it might be 0.2. Yeah, yeah. And I think, I mean, I haven't, I haven't spent a lot of time on thresholding on a practical basis. I know that, you know, the guys who are closer to product um, do. And, you know, I think that the important point is that when you look at the curve, right. And say, well, I do it, which algorithm is going to be a winning algorithm, which is going to be a better classifier. Okay. If you have the curve such that the, you know, I'll go back to this slide. If you have a, if you have an algorithm, all right, that has a better ROC, better ROC AUC, P, better PRC and better PRC ROC or average precision, that you know, if you you optimize that, you can compare, you know, where you kind of are on your curves, you know, from the optimization, and you might choose different tweaks to get the best one that you want. Okay, so I have a question. Um, Stephen, if you could go back to the slide where you actually first introduced thresholding, there was like a, it was, it was a white background and a whole bunch of columns of numbers. Not uh, yeah, one. yeah, uh, yeah, that one. So, so um, Th there's no thresholding on this slide. Pardon? There's no threshold. This is this slide is is simply about making the ROC curve. There's nothing here about thresholding. Right, but the question is, the question I have is, um, how do you calculate the sensitivity and specificity? Is it corresponding to individual cases, or is it corresponding to the cumulative cases at that line? It is the individual. It's the individual case. So like, for example, for the first index case, right? So if you have, again, we have our data set X, which has 5,200 examples, okay? It's gonna be balanced. There are gonna be 2,600 positive examples and 2,600 negative examples. Does everybody agree on that? Do you agree on that with me? Okay, mm -hmm. so for the first case out of those 5,200, we know that this is an example of a positive case. That's our ground truth. This is, this is given, this is the label, all right? Then, okay, the classifier will output a probability because the probability, you know, yeah, we, we haven't set a threshold here, but we, we have, we, we, we would set a threshold as what's our positive and what's our negative. Okay. I, I see your point, what you're trying to say. So maybe I, I'm going to set a, a threshold of 0.5. All right. In this particular case, because it's balanced to use the equal error rate. All right. So this is close to one. Okay. It's point, you know, the, the, I'm going to consider this as a one, right? This is a positive and a positive, and if we go back for a second, 
to this, positive and positive is a true positive. Yep. All right. So we'll count that as a true positive. Okay. And we'll calculate that as the true positives and false negatives, but I'm sorry, the, the sensitivity is, is calculated as a running tally of the, the denominator, okay? So like, I think it's one over 2,600 and false negatives. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, it, it would be one over 2,600 to get that. 0 0.004, because I don't think there have been any false negatives at that point, right? I, okay, so I think that sensitivity is calculated assuming you set your threshold where the, where the classifier probability output is. So if you set your threshold there, you would get one true positive and all the rest of them would be, uh, would be... Negative. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, and they, yeah. Yeah, and they would I, be, I, and most of them would be false negatives, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, you're running the, you're running the, the threat. Sorry, you're running the thresholds down the spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. So that column, the second column, the classifier probability output is is actually what you're calling the threshold. You, you set your threshold at that point, uh, and then you calculate the sensitivity and specificity based on that threshold. I don't think so, because look. You have, you have here case five, right? Mm -hmm. We have the probability output at 0.92 mm -hmm. and you have the ground truth is zero, mm -hmm. right? So this is a negative mm -hmm. case. If that was the case, you know, this is, this is a positive, this is classified as a positive, but it's a negative. Okay, we compare the two, the two and this becomes a false positive. Yes. All right. But every, every time you set the threshold, that changes the numbers for true positives, false positives. No, uh, that, that changes the threshold, uh, excuse me. Every time you set the threshold at one of those probability levels, you have to recompute all of the TP, FN, FP numbers and therefore you recompute your sensitivity and specificity. So that's why I think that the uh, fifth, the uh, last two columns correspond to those measures uh, computed based on that classifier probability as a threshold. So that if you set your classifier probability output at 9, 0.95003, then if you set your threshold there, then everything with a greater probability than that is considered as a positive and everything with a lower probability than that is considered as a negative. Um, and then you can compute your sensitivity and specificity based on that. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree. So to, if you really wanted to make this uh, even more detailed before the sensitivity and specif one minus specificity columns, we would have four more columns for true positive. Yep true negative, false yep. positive, false negative, corresponding to that column two classifier probability, plus two more columns to calculate the true positive rate and the false positive rate. Right. And then from there, calculate sensitivity specificity, sure, but you then use the true positive rate and the false positive rate values to draw the ROC curves. Yeah, I think that that would be, to be honest with you, I think that that would be helpful because the way I'm presenting it here is, I think, a little bit confusing. Well, this is what, what you're showing here with this table is for one specific threshold. So if you look up the ROC curve, it's one vertical line, right? Like, because you, when you move from left to right, you're lowering the threshold in right. the ROC curve. So this is just one like infinitesimal slice of your. No, no, it's, it's, really it's you know no, it, I mean? it's all the thresholds. This, this column, the second column gives you all no, the possible thresholds. No, no, the, the, no, the second column is the model's predicted output for that particular document or particular uh, radiology thing. Isn't that correct? 
my understanding is column the second, two, the second column that upwards is probability the out, out. Is, is the is the output. It's the it's the probability output. Okay, so it's it's if I run a if I run a, a data point through my classifier, which has a you know ground truth value of one positive, okay, I'm gonna get a output from that specific value, okay, of you know 0.9999, right? And I'm gonna be very confident that that is a positive. So that kind of throw, it, it's gonna throw into the true positive case. Um, and uh, it's gonna throw into the true positive case. And, you know, I can then, you know, confidently put my, you know, one here, you know, one here and, you know, false negatives is whatever the false negatives is at that point. I have to, I, you know, this is a confusing, this is maybe not the, the best example. I, just kind of, I, I kind of threw this in about in the 15 minutes piece, before so, I was doing. So I should probably, uh, well, I should have probably. You're just, missing, you're just missing one piece. You're just missing one additional piece of information on top of what Joseph and Mosh just added to the columns, which is what this is for a specific threshold. You could, you could put here threshold equals. You know, so that people know this is for one point on that one vertical slice of the ROC curve, one yep. threshold. Yep. Yeah, I, I think it's I think it's it's a poor example. Okay, let's pretend I didn't show it. <laughs> How's that? No, it was right. good. It was good to see. It was just you know, some things that were a little confusing. I like yeah. it a lot. That that was not that was not in my original talk. I, I'll it'd be very blunt about that. So I added that for you guys. So I ended up confusing you further on it. So I probably should not have put it in. That's my mistake. Sorry about that. No, no, but you didn't, you didn't, you, you didn't confuse me. It helped clarify a lot of stuff, but I had this underlying assumption about it. I don't know why I was right about that assumption, but seeing that individual document view is very important and accurate to me. But Darren, that, that what you're saying about that, I don't think it's true. I think the, the, uh, Anytime you see a rock plot, that is all thresholds. That that is not just one threshold. So the specificities and well, but, but, um, I yep. Sorry, I, I honestly, I've got, I don't, I've got I like don't, this delay. I, I'm I don't know how to best to answer that at this point. So let me let me run the numbers so I can feel good about it, and maybe I'll post a, an update a little bit later. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I am concerned I'm going to say something wrong or inaccurate here, and I'd rather not. Uh, again, I just kind of, this is, this is just something I kind of threw together to just explain the, the you know, the, the rank order stair-stepping that you, you know, undergo when you're making a ROC curve. It's, you know, to the extent that, you know, doing it manually, doing it by hand, I mean, it's, it's nice to know, but... Um, you know, honestly, you just throw it into PyCom or, you know, the uh, ROC package in uh, scikit-learn. And, yeah, and so, it, so Stephen, here's how you could check. Um, well, uh, I, I mean, what, I, I, would, I, would, I would have to. Yeah, you know, I mean, here, here's how you could check. Just pick one row of that, of that matrix that you showed, of that, uh, of that slide that you showed, and set the threshold where that probability is, and then um, calculate the TP, FP, FN, all those numbers, and then calculate the specificity and, you know, the um, basically calculate those two numbers in the last two columns and see if they agree with what are the, with what, with the numbers that are already there. Uh, because the, the thing I'm suggesting is that if you set the threshold to be where that probability is and then make all your classifications based on that threshold, you know, for a given line, for a given row, set the threshold where the probability is make all the classifications, calculate all those metrics, and see if they agree with the numbers in the column, in the last two columns. Uh, Joseph, I have a question. Uh, yeah. Like in the actual ROC curve, uh, wouldn't you have to uh, calculate the sensitivity and specificity for all the examples at that threshold? By the way, I mean, the technique which you are saying is uh, at 0.99, I would just take one example. But that's not how the actual curve is, right? You would take all the examples at a threshold. That, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. You, you set the threshold to be 
wherever that classifier probability output is, right? Based on that setting, you now make all of the classifications of all the cases, and then you get the TP, the FN, um, and the FP okay. numbers. And then so from not, those numbers- not So what you're saying, it's not cumulative, instead it takes the entire data set that's for all right. the rows. That's, that's what I'm saying, yes. Okay, okay. That makes more sense, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, so let's let's uh, switch now to gear on and finish up. Let's see where is it. Hang on a sec. Oh, but in that case, the running tally is a useless column, right? Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. About I mean, we're really using that for anything then. All right. So I don't know if people want to take a few minutes to review this material since we've talked about it kind of ad infinitum. I think it's just, I think it's just fine to, to quickly go through it and go through the code in scikit-learn. So from, do you guys see my, do you guys see my mouse on the, on the screen or no? I have to do the yes. answer. I do see. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. So, Basically, going through, you know, really quickly, um, he just, you know, reiterates, you know, the plot of, you know, true positive rate versus false positive rate, or, you know, sensitivity recall versus one minus specificity. Um, we call the RC, we import RC curve, and we call the RC curve by giving it, you know, the two labels. Uh, rather the two uh, parameters, uh, data and the da label data, um, doing a matplotlib uh, plot. We got something around here uh, from the example. Uh, and this is a uh, 43.6. Uh, I, th I think he's choosing a, a threshold of 43.68 uh, recall, uh, which is really, you know, corresponding to a very uh, specific um, distribution. Um, the AUC can be integrated. Um, 0.5 is random. One is perfect. This looks like a pretty good one. Uh, 0.96, so this is a pretty good R, uh, AUC. Um, it talks about how the ROC curve is similar to precision recall. Which do you use when? Uh, and kind of indirectly, he tells us to use the uh, ROC or, uh, in balance cases and precision recall when in imbalance cases, uh, because the, as a rule of thumb, you should prefer the PR curve whenever the positive class is rare or when you care more about the false positives than the false negatives. Now, one of the reasons why I showed you that bias uh, chart is that the bias is somewhat high in precision recall. Uh, so it's, it's not necessarily something that you would want to use, I think, on its own, even though it has been used on its own quite a bit. Um, so the, you know, if you have a balanced data set, you can use the ROC curve. You know, you may think this is really good, but then when you look at the precision recall, there's room for improvement uh, versus the, the prior uh, graph. This is the ROC graph, the PRC graph was what we looked at uh, earlier on the week. Um, they train a random forest um, and the R he, he, 
he says that the RC curve function expects labels and scores, but instead of scores, you can give it class probabilities. And you plot the random forest versus the pre previous uh, algorithm, and the random forest does better because it's overfitting, but that's fine. So quickly running through the code. Where's the code? I think we are here. All right, so you can import ROC from sklearn metrics, get your false positive rate, true positive rate in your thresholds from the training data and the label data, I believe. Um, I'm not sure quite. It's taking a bit. I ran this earlier, so I may have to reconnect. I think you are connected. RAM and disk okay. look good. So then um, he defines a, uh, a plot function for this um, with matplotlib. This is the output that we saw in the book. In terms of ROC AUC, there's also that and the 0.96 score that we discussed is a good score for an ROC AUC. Um, I have, you know, you people- You can reload the page. All right, let me- Just, right, exactly. I might have to rerun everything. Let's see. I'm guessing I have to rerun everything. Yeah, no, it's uh, still connecting on the top right. It says busy. Oh. Maybe I got kicked out. But it should reestablish. Not quite sure. Well, I'm going to pretend that well, I can't know anymore. Let's give it a minute or two, and if it doesn't work, I will concede defeat. Stephen, if you click on runtime, it might allow you to start all over again or something, or uh, let's see, interrupt execution, yeah. And then start up right there, interrupt execution. Yeah, yeah I just did that. And then okay. rest and then, restart runtime or restart uh, run all. Yeah, well, well, you don't want to run all. You want to just run um, down to where you want to run to, right? So. Um, yeah, but I think it, it's, if I remember with this particular notebook, it's, it's loading a bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, maybe that's it. So I might, and that might be why we're, why we, we're kind of it's, it's trying to run the whole notebook, obviously. So, um. Yeah, be careful because right after the ROC curve, there's a, a SGD classifier that kind of takes a long time to run no matter where you run it. Well, if, it's, if, it, if it runs afterwards, I'm not, I'm okay with it.
All right. Well, okay. Well, that was exciting. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. So <laughs> at this point, I think, uh, I think we're, we're starting to go on diminishing returns. We'll be going on for an hour and a half and I don't want to, I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, so I'm not really sure why uh, Google is uh, conspiring against me. Um, <laughs> maybe they're doing some work on the, uh, the system and they're not going to give me an instance, but uh, who knows. But I think that's pretty much it. Um, anything, let me see if there's anything really notable I think I want to say about the, um, the code. Not really. So the AUC, the AUC rock means the area under the curve of the rock curve, right? And yes. And um, and you would like to um, let's see, you would like to maximize that in order to um, you know get the best classifier you can, right? On the basis, I'm, I mean, on the basis of ROC, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, if you're comparing, you know, two different, you know. ROC curves, uh, and you know the numbers are are fairly wide. Um, yeah, you're you're going to want to try to maximize. Now, where you get into trouble is you know with that one slide I showed you in terms of the um, where you're operating on the curve. Are you operating on the sensitivity portion of the curve or the specificity portion mm -hmm. of the curve? Because mm -hmm. if you you could have two a, you could have two um, classifiers with identical ROC AUCs, but one is, you know, much better on the sensitivity portion of the curve and much worse on the specificity portion of the curve. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to, you know, create a uh, algorithm for, you know, screening, like the, the, I mentioned that, you know, the two algorithms, even though the single number is the same, you know, the, the one algorithm will outperform the other uh, in terms of the purpose that it's intended to. Mm -hmm. so and it, it, there, there is a benefit, I think, to, to plotting out the ROCs and, and comparing them. And, and then you said something about, like, you should look at both the area under the rock curve and also the area under the precision recall curve because they measure different things. And so if you had a, a classifier that when you compare two classifiers, if both the area under the rock curve and the area under the um, the um, precision recall is better than the other classifier, then that's a clear reason for preferring one, one over the other, one, one model over the other, right? Yeah, and, and, and it's, it's not just the area, it's, it's the domination. The mm -hmm. fact that the curves lie outside of each other without crossing. Um, and that is provable mathematically. So, you know, if, if you think about it, if you have, you know, a curve that lies completely outside of another, it will, by definition, have a larger AUC. Um, when you say a curve that lies completely outside another, um, what do you mean right. by that? Or like, for example, let me, let me switch over. Yeah, I think I remember that slide where uh, that slide where you showed those distributions. So, let me see if I can annotate. There's a blog I posted to the chat okay. that you could use to show the specific ruling in, ruling out thing that you would uh, that you were mentioning, Stephen. Hold on a sec. All right, so. If I have this curve, right, and I have this curve, this curve lies completely outside of this curve. This curve is set to dominate this curve, all right? The area of this curve will always be greater than the area of this curve by definition. Uh, let's see. You're um you're still showing the <clears throat> I'm sorry, you're I'm still seeing the um Oh sorry, I'm oh. Sorry. Sorry, 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 Oh you're drawing on that. Or oh somebody's drawing on it. I'm drawing on it. Oh, okay. And I think there I just I think I just erased it. Uh, okay. but let me let me let me try to do it again. 
Okay, now I see the precision recall curves and average precision. Right. That's why, yeah. So in this example, okay, I have this curve and I have this curve. This curve always lies outside of this curve. Mm -hmm. okay? Yeah. On a mathematical basis, all right, the two, this curve is set to dominate this curve. Yes. This curve will always have a greater area under the curve than this curve. Mm -hmm. Are we agreed? Yep. Okay. However, Take a look at this. I have this curve. And I have this curve. Which curve is better? The answer is, is where are you operating? Okay. If you want to be operating on you know, this portion of the curve, well, the green curve is a better choice. Mm -hmm. If you want to be operating on the orange portion of the curve, the orange portion of the better choice is the better choice. These curves could have ROC, AUC that is equivalent or very close. Mm -hmm. So if you just use the single value to compare between the two, you kind of go down the tubes. Now that's a great point. Um, so yeah, in that curve, the red curve should actually touch the x-axis where the green curve does because they both they both come down and touch at one. But I see your point that the red curve well, can have me, the let me, same. Let me do it on the let me do it on the ROC because uh, yeah. the ROC because the ROC is yeah. the is a better example. Yeah, but but your point is clear. I mean, the the curves could have the same area, but depending on where you're operating, one could be better. All right. Okay, so you have this curve. Which is compared, that's a crappy curve, hang on. Okay, so you have the, the purple curve and the lilac curve, right? Yep. So in this portion of the curve, okay, we're focusing on sensitivity. All right, this is where the false positive rate is highest. If I Basically, because the curves cross, you can have an identical ROC AUC in each. Yep. Yep. All right. That's There's, clear. No, yep. There's no domination. Yeah. The lilac curve dominates the purple curve only in the portion that deals with specificity. So if I want a more specific test, my lilac <laughs> curve is better than my purple curve. If you need a low false positive rate, yep. then yeah, yeah. Okay, but okay, if I'm looking for a sensitive test, my purple curve is dominating my lilac curve in this region. Yeah. Okay, so I would choose the lilac curve algorithm. Thank you, that's a great explanation. Sorry, it took me a little while to get to it, but yeah. <laughs> That's the, it's, it, yeah, I mean, I, 
that's something that you know wasn't in, entirely intuitively you know obvious to me either uh, but it's it's vetted all right i think that's pretty much it uh does anyone have any examples of how of applying roc in multi-class i mean i have some imagined ideas but ROC and multi-class. I haven't actually spent a lot of time with that, so I'm not gonna comment upon it. Uh, I believe that you have to split it into individual components, but I might be wrong about that. You know, it's like one versus many uh, when, you, uh, when you run it out. Right, 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 right. So quite, I, got a, I had a little bit of a crazy idea, um, which is, can you use ROC, treat exactly what you just said, like treat each class in a multi-class problem as its own, you know, binary classifier. That's one way you could do it, right? Do the, or, or the one versus all, whatever. But, and then, so for each class, you could find your, like maybe you could write an automatically, you could find an optimal threshold that's class specific rather than using one threshold for your entire problem. So I guess that's also asking, do people use ROC to automatically find optimal thresholds based on their, their context? You know, I, I, and I don't know, I don't know necessarily um, if that is statistically rigorous. Um, the, the uh, you know, if you're optimizing for each, you know, individual, threshold, I don't know if that is essentially kosher. I mean, I think it's, I think it's a way to get things done, but I don't, I don't know if you're overfitting with that, you know, and that's kind of, you know, comes to the, you know, do you want one algorithm to do everything or do you want a lot of individual algorithms optimized for a certain thing to, to do everything? I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I honestly don't know. Yeah, in, um, to your comment, I don't know about the statistical quotientness of it, but in segmentation problems, especially in Kaggle, because there the score is what seems to matter, not the generalization post um, <clears throat> the scoring. But in that case, then it's often the technique you suggested is used, which is you could have a single threshold for all classes, or you could have a class specific threshold. Yeah, but how I mean, you derive it is and do you know, tricky. Do, do you? Do, yeah, how you derive it is tricky, and often, you know, that's done by non-kosher means because you test, you probe the data that's hidden from you, and then try to develop what you think the class balance is in the data that you don't have access to in thereby try to guess what the thresholds should be. So that's where the statistical non quotient is. That's at least one area where the statistical non quotient is comes from. It, it could be interesting. You could do a, you could probably write some sort of algorithm that would using your training set, optimize your class specific thresholds. And I'm talking about like multi-class where you have thousands of classes. But the question is, you do something tricky like that, it may just help your action. In reality, it may help you so little. You know, like there's all these clever things you can do, but maybe on Kaggle are worth it, but Kaggle are worth it, but not in most situations. Yeah, I wouldn't even know if the computation, you know, burden on that would be it's substantial, I would think. Maybe not. All right, anything else? Thanks so much, Stephen. Um, this, was, this was really terrific. And I think that um, a, lot of us, uh, a lot of us got a lot out of this because this is, goes way beyond what you learn in most, uh, you know, what you learn in most uh, books. And 
uh, you're always seeing this brought up, the rock curve analysis brought up in papers, but there's not very good, there are not a lot of good references for it. So really no, appreciate what I, you've done. I, I, think it's, I think it's tough because, you know, honestly, you know, when I started, you know, getting into that, you know, I, I, the data is, it's all spread out all across the place. And, you know, with a lot of these methods, um, you know, in the confusion matrix, you know, you have, you have data in the, you know, where I, I actually, I think that where the, the folks are the most um, advanced in understanding this material is actually in uh, weather forecasting. Uh, hmm. If you look at in the weather forecasting uh, literature, the number of metrics they have based upon the confusion matrix, it, it, it's, it's astounding. I mean, they're doing all sorts of normalization. They're, they're just doing, you know, everything like 70 or 80 that they get from this, which is amazing. But we in medicine are only using realistically three sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value. Okay. The FDA wants ROC curves and AUC ROC added on to that. Okay. But that is where the state of the art is right now. And, and as we're, you know, developing algorithms and we're, you know, developing algorithms that we expect to apply across, you know, different complex data um, uh, settings uh, and, you know, for portability and transferability, you know, we don't have the language of metrics, you know, established, you know, in the medical literature and some of the scientific literature to easily, you know, to easily do that. We're not considering what each metric actually gives us because a lot of times the meaning is opaque, you know? I mean, you can get that, you know, okay, further to the upper left-hand corner is better, further to the upper right-hand corner is better, but, but you know, what do these numbers really mean? Uh, and, you know, that's kind of why I touched on the markedness and informedness because I think that those are actually, you know, very useful um, and, you know, they haven't caught on as much as I think that they perhaps should, but, you know, it, it, you know, it's part of the statistical deficit that we have, you know, in our culture, you know, as we certainly have it as physicians and it exists in other, in other areas as well, you know, and, you know, statistics is going to be concerned with its own, uh, you know, its own domain. So, you know, what I'm hopeful is that this starts a dialogue, you know, on, you know, gosh, you know, what do we actually need, okay, uh, to, you know, make better algorithms? What do we need to, you know, make products that are actually going to work well in medicine uh, and in mission critical applications? Not that, you know, we, we put, you know, a not a, you know, not really an AI, but a, an autonomously functioning algorithm in somewhere. And, you know, it, you know, creates, you know, massive errors that cause a loss of life and, and the significant loss of, you know, uh, money. Um, yeah. And I think you've, I think you've pointed out that um, people tend to look at these things as, um, you know, cookie cutter formulas and they just say, oh, I'll report my, my um, precision and my sensitivity and look at how great a model I have, but they haven't really thought through the question of what is this model going to be used for and what are the right, what are the right metrics to, um, to analyze it by. And, and if you take that broader view, uh, then you will avoid making some of the errors that you've, that you've pointed out that people can make. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think that that's, you know, it, it, it goes, it goes far beyond, you know, the, the kind of like the ethical responsibility and it comes down into a, like an actual scientific responsibility. You know, we have to pin this out down. It's not established. We should be establishing it, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, you know, people that are more statistically minded than myself, you know, probably should be the ones doing it, but I, I haven't seen, you know, any clear <laughs> indication of that yet. So I'm kind of trying to beat the drum. Um, well, this is a terrific contribution to our group. And I really thank you for your generosity and taking the time to, to produce and, and, uh, and present this. No problem, man. I appreciated uh, the time and everybody, you know, suffering through this, uh, for, uh, a good, uh, hour and a half of, uh, some, uh, some math. Uh, and I, I actually appreciate the discussion on this slide. This is definitely going to have to be, uh, uh, re revised for the next iteration of this talk. 
um, because it's, it's just not clear enough. Um, but anyway, okay. Well, thanks a lot. And uh, I will turn, how do I turn the screen over back to um, you? Uh, no, th there's no re need to do that. I'll just end the meeting and um, uh, say everyone, we'll see you on Wednesday and thanks for coming. All right.